we start with where we want to go. And I think it's the same issue as we try to, you know, bring, you know, Republicans along and have a bigger coalition around it. Everybody wants affordable, quality health care. We all want that. We all need that. We need that for our families, for our businesses, for our community. You're with The Capitalist Sage, a twice a month podcast that seeks out entrepreneurs and experts that speak to the real world life of doing business for their sage advice. Now with your hosts, Carl Barham and Rico Figliolini. Welcome to The Capitalist Sage podcast, where we talk to business owners, leaders in the community about things that matter here in Petrie Corners and surrounding areas. Um, we're to inform people, share information with folks and and, and just help people understand some of the issues that might be impacting, whether it's their lives, their homes, their businesses, and so on. Um, I'm Carl Barham with uh, Transworld Business Advisor, and my co-host is Rico Figliolini with Digital Marketing, um, Mighty, Rock. Mighty, Mighty Rocket Digital Marketing, and the publisher of the Peachy Corner Magazine. Um, hey, Rico, how are you doing today? Hey, Carl. Good, good. Let's talk about some sponsors we have. Yeah, let's do that. So let's get that out of the way before we get into our, with our guest today. Um, so we are at Atlanta Tech Park in the city of Peachtree Corners, and it's actually an accelerator that has houses about 90 plus companies, uh, has a far reach through the southeast because of the venture capital work it does as well, and because of the executive, Robin Benfei, who's who founded this location and this place, and she was an ex- executive with Samsung, um, BlackBerry, and a few other companies. So. Um, we're glad to be here. We're glad they're a sponsor of ours and that allow us to use the podcast room. Uh, this place is located on Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners, which is about a one and a half mile autonomous vehicle track that anyone can come to. It's a living lab, essentially. So autonomous vehicles, internet of everything, people walking, people driving, everything's live. There's no make-believe here. And you can bring your company, small or large or startup, or established company and actually test things on this lab, on this one and a half mile track. And the backbone of this, which is enabled by 5G, Sprint's 5G technology, right? Yep. That everyone's talking about, 5G. You can't do autonomous vehicles without 5G. You can't do the internet of everything without that. But you got to bring the internet to it, though, right? And so you still got to use cable and fiber to be able to do that. And our lead sponsor is Hargrey Fiber. And they're the backbone of Curiosity Lab at Peace Records. They actually provide the fiber for this to be able to work their, this one and a half mile track. It's incredible the technology that's already being deployed right here in Petrie Corners yeah. to enable smart city application, everything from you know, e-scooters where you can get around the scooter, that drive, driverless shuttles, mm-hmm. um, both both the backbone that's being built and, and the Sprint um, a 5G network is enabling that. So a lot of companies yeah. are coming into this area to, to explore oh, their technologies. Tremendous amount. Almost like, I mean, better than... Planet M in Michigan. I mean, we just we got the place to be. So, if you want to find out about Atlanta Tech Park, it's atlantatechpark.com, hargrayfiber.com for if you're a small business or an enterprise size business and you're looking for fiber and enterprise solutions, they're the people to go to. Well, today we have a special episode of Capitalist Sage where um, one of the things we like to do is share um, the different types of. Of, of leaders and people, thought leaders in the community that's help contributing to the success of our community, whether it's through business, whether it's through government, whether it's through citizenship and, and private individuals. And today, it's my pleasure to welcome Carolyn Bardot from um, running for the U.S. Senate seat here. Congress. The U.S. Seven, Congress. Seventh seven Congressional seven District. Seventh con- Congressional District um, here in Georgia. Um, hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you all for having me. Sure. It's a pleasure, actually. Second time. Second time. For us, yes. When you ran back in 2018. 18, yep. Yeah. I'm back to finish the job. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Good. So one of the things we wanted to start off with just kind of reintroduce you to folks that may may not uh, uh, know who you are and, and kind of learn a little bit why are you um, jumping into this and, and serving your country by running for Congress. Right. So a little bit of my background. I live in Swanee. I have a 
my husband and I, we have an eight-year-old son who's enrolled in public schools here. Uh, my day job is I teach at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State. I teach public policy and public finance and have spent a lot of my life um, working in various roles in public service. I work for several members of Congress, for a U.S. Senator. I was director of the Senate Budget and Evaluation Office here in Georgia. I founded the Center for State and Local Finance and so have been in public life and in public service in many ways for a long time. Um, I got into this race back in July of 2017 mm -hmm. and uh, was motivated by several things, but one of the big ones was health care and what's happened with uh, health care reform in this country. And uh, my parents passed away uh, two years ago after my father, right. after a really prolonged illness. And, uh, you know, all of the discretionary income was eaten up paying for health care costs. And so uh, watching the skyrocketing prices of prescription drugs, the extortionary rates that many of us pay for health insurance mm -hmm. in this community, yeah. Uh, we have 110,000 people without health insurance. And so that was a big driver, sort of watching the destruction of the Affordable Care Act and just sort of the, the, the many, many issues that many of us face in, in health care. Yeah. That was a big issue at the time, still is. Right? It, it yeah. still is very pressing. And actually, it's very topical because, mm -hmm. um, you know, as you, you hear more about other countries battling um, health concerns and so on, what are some of the things you've seen in other countries that might – help us look at healthcare and how we do it here differently. Right. Um, so I'll start with healthcare generally. And, uh, you know, most other countries have some form of universal health care and they have different ways that they're trying to get there. They use different strategies. Uh, the one I talk about a lot is, uh, you know, going back, standing the Affordable Care Act back up uh, actually implementing that legislation, a lot of pieces of that were never implemented, mm -hmm. including the expansion of Medicaid here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, by not expanding Medicaid in Georgia, the state basically returns to the federal government between $2.2 and $3 billion a year. That's voluntary, too, I think. It is voluntary, <coughs> yeah. So, the, so we voluntarily returned away to $2 billion. $2 billion a year, at least, you mm -hmm. know, um, as much as $3 billion now. And that means that around 500,000 people in the state don't have health insurance now. Um, and that's a lot of people to hang out to dry. Mm -hmm. um, I also am someone who thinks we need a public option on the exchange. We still, that won't cover everybody. Um, and we need a low cost alternative for uh, small businesses and for individuals to opt into as well. How do you feel about, um, with everything that's going on? I mean, there's podcasts galore now and shows about coronavirus, the novel virus, yeah. um, the pandemic, according to CDC, well, who will probably happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is expanding. Mm -hmm. um, you can get the test maybe if you're lucky and someone's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get the test, I mean, there's so many questions about who's going to actually pay for it. Yeah. And how are you going to take care of hospital, hospital bills if you're actually infected badly and you have to go to the hospital? Yeah. So what, What's your thoughts on that? So we just saw a story uh, in Florida where mm -hmm. a, uh, a person thought they had, you know, some kind of coronavirus. They went to the hospital and then were immediately slapped with a $2,000 bill for it. Right. Um, I think one of the things about coronavirus is it really, uh, the, the COVID-19, right. is it really shines a bright light on some really serious problems in this country. Um, and one of them is that we have hundreds of thousands of people, we have millions of people mm -hmm. in this state, over a million people without health insurance. And, uh, you know, even if you're not worried about them, you might be worried about yourself because it would be really helpful if they feel sick, if they can see a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it is, you know, we face a situation where we may be in real trouble because we still, after years of arguing about this, still do not provide health care and access to a doctor for many, many people in our community. And for the people that need it, that can't afford it, then are not going to go because they can't afford to pay it. I mean, exactly. Yeah. They, they are much less likely to go. And I think... You know, we talk about the response to coronavirus and people are like, well, you know, don't touch your face or uh, <laughs> be sure to wash your hands. Yes, there's and so many times. <laughs> th that's right. I mean, and that's good. That's important. Mm -hmm. But we also have to recognize that the response also needs to address the gaping holes in our I, I don't want to say safety net because we think of that as being associated with poor people. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we all need a safety net at different times. Mm -hmm. 
Another huge issue is um, paid family medical leave. We have lots of people in our community uh, who live paycheck to paycheck. Um, what are they going to do if they are quarantined? Uh, we have lots of people who don't have any kind of paid family medical leave and they need, you know, that that money. Right. What are they going to do? And so when we talk about how we respond to the pandemic, we need to think not just about sort of those basic health care, washing your hands, those mm-hmm. kinds of things, but also how as a society do we respond to well, it? Well, the economic impact that yeah. it's going to have. If, if you do some, if you think about it, some simple math, if, 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 as people start getting sick, yeah. they're going to flood emergency rooms. Yes. And the cost of servicing that many people is going to is going to really be huge. Not just the cost, but there won't be enough beds, enough ventilators, enough equipment, enough safety equipment for the healthcare workers. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, some people showing up at Emory, maybe. There, 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 so there's going to be an economic impact. The question is, you know, can you plan ahead and spend the money wisely so that people could can go earlier before it requires an emergency room, get treatment, get, get, get. Is $8 billion enough? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I think yeah. it's, you know, it's a start and we're going to have to take this one step at a time. Um, but there are many tiers to this issue, right? One is sort of the, you know, how do we deal with this as a society? Um, there's another, yes, how is our healthcare network going to deal with it? And obviously we really, have to try to protect our healthcare workers. And we saw thousands and thousands of them in China get yeah. sick from uh, the, the COVID-19. And um, we're going to have to think about that. And do we have what they need to be supported? Mm-hmm. And one thing I see when a lot of folks are talking about, you know, it's a small percentage of people who die from this or need hospitalization. Our problem is that even a small percentage of a large number can quickly overwhelm mm-hmm. our right our hospitals. And one of the reasons we quarantine and kind of shut things down is not because, you know, it's going to wipe out and kill lots of people. It's just that we have to stop that overwhelming of our healthcare system and try to manage, you know, how uh, the the disease is unfolding. And so, you know, I I know there are good people thinking about this. I just hope, you know, that they have a voice in this process and are able to help us manage through. So I'm always curious about the impact for small business owners. So, Mm -hmm. um, I saw a statistic 44% or so of people are employed by small business. The 99.7% of all businesses happen to be small businesses and they they don't, may not have the ability to extend, um, large company healthcare benefits that, that, that people get to enjoy. Um, what are some of the strategies that, that business owners at least have available to them and what can they do to get their voice heard to help drive change so that they can, they can offer their employees better options? Well, again, there's sort of the immediate crisis issue, right? And then there's the bigger picture uh, issue. And, you know, for me, Ensuring that we have, you know, some form of universal health care coverage is a small business issue, right? And we need to do it to protect our small businesses so that they are not being crushed by the burden of health insurance and health care coverage and that they can provide that for their employees. Um, so, you know, one of the many reasons I really advocate for that is because I hear from small businesses all the time and how they really struggle to get insurance for themselves and for their employees. Um The immediate crisis is, you know, I think folks need to start advocating uh, with the state government and with the federal government um, to, uh, you know, get some real solutions coming down the pike, um, some real ideas for what is going to happen and how we are going to manage through this if this happens and how we're going to protect small businesses. Um, I think that is an issue and I don't think it's really been addressed. Yeah. Um, And I, and I, I hear it often when I talk to small business owners. They're, they they are doing what they need to do to survive first, and they're they're one um, catastrophe or or something away from really losing their business very often. Um, if I if I could ask a little bit, so as we see problems like this, and healthcare is a big one, there's a lot of others like that. Um, what are ways that the two parties can work together to come to solution? There seems to be. Um, a blockage of that that used to exist many years ago, but it's getting more polarized and we're not seeing people come together. Have you seen hope that 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 could be improved? Um, 
I, you know, <laughs> I wish I could say yes, but it's it's a tough situation we're in. I have worked with Republicans, you know, in the past when I worked in Congress for, I worked for a Democratic Senator, uh, Ron Wyden. Every single piece of legislation I worked on had Republican co-sponsors. Um, I think that coming together is very, very important. Um, but I think our first step is we need to agree that everybody needs health insurance and have some basic fundamental agreement on those issues. And the electorate needs to send that message that that's something they want. Um, and then there are lots of ways to solve that problem, I think, in ways that, you know, Republicans might agree with. Um, actually, the Affordable Care Act, right, was originally introduced in Massachusetts by Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. It was a Republican idea. Um, it was a bipartisan idea. And we need to go back to that time when we can have that kind of conversation. It was a bit of a uh, moderate, moderate Republican idea that they disowned later, though, right? So I don't know if they'll ever go back to that, yeah. at least this set of Republicans. Yeah, right. it's very unfortunate. It was a market-based mm -hmm. idea um, for trying to address, you know, get us to universal health coverage. So how do you find then, for example, right now, Warren, Senator Warren decided to bow out at this point today mm -hmm. made sense. I mean, she just had no path to go. Yeah. So we have two, I mean, there may be a third one in Tulsi, but she's like 2% or something. So there's two, really two candidates, right? Mm -hmm. um, two different plans. Mm -hmm. One wants all, all, it's like almost all or nothing. So where do we go from this? If, if between the two of them, between Biden and Sanders, right? I mean, I feel the burn, but <laughs> I don't know if I could go all the way there, but how do, right. how do you feel about that? Um, you know, when I talk to people in the district, and I have spent a lot of time talking to people about this issue, mm -hmm. um, we start with where we want to go. And I think it's the same issue as we try to, you know, bring, you know, Republicans along and have a bigger coalition around it. Everybody wants affordable, quality health care. We all want that. We all need that. We need that for our families, for our businesses, for our community. Mm -hmm. How we get there, we can come up with different ways to get there. Um, you know, again, I think we already have a law on the books. That's the most straightforward way. I do believe in fiscal responsibility and, uh, you know, the public option has been shown to save money. Um, and, you know, I, I think we can come up with ways to get there, uh, whether it is, you know, a Sanders way, a Biden way. We all have to focus on the goal of where we want to go and then work our way through how we're going to get there. Very often you'll see, um, you know, different strategies play out um, in, in public policy. Um, how do you get grassroots um, involvement on an issue like this? How do you mobilize people to, to really get out there? And like, what specifically can people do to whether their, their, their representative is Republican or Democrat, get them to look at an issue in a bipartisan way? Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big believer in education and having dialogue with folks. Um, the most difficult policy issue I ever addressed was um, helping the state balance the budget during the Great Recession. And it was a really tough time. Georgia's revenues dropped by 20%. And what I did, and many other policymakers did, was we did public forum after public forum after public forum, showing what was happening with the state revenues, showing how we are going to try to address this issue. And I think we need to have something similar on healthcare, mm -hmm. um, where we are just out there talking to folks. And I, you know, as part of the campaign, I do hundreds of community meetings and, uh, you know, and we talk about these kinds of issues. And I think that's very, very important for, you know, getting ha people having a chance to kind of hash out those ideas uh, in, a, in a community. Let me ask you about technology. You know, we talk about business a lot on this podcast, but recently Google was found to have been um, working with a healthcare provider that does the back office work, if you will. So they've been accumulating data and uh, not just generic data, but names and everything like that. Um, it's coming to the forefront now, Google, Facebook. I mean, they're all in there in the mix. Apple's doing stuff, but Google is the biggest gorilla in the room, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you want to deal with technology where, on the one hand, something like that can actually help mm -hmm. during a, a crisis like an epidemic uh, or can help bring down costs? Mm -hmm. But you have to share that. You have to either get rid of the privacy, limit the privacy. I mean, it's, it's very shaky. How do you, how do you handle that? 
yeah. in this new age. I mean, what do you do? It's, an, it's particularly an interesting question for me because as somebody who does research around public policy, mm-hmm. um, I see the enormous power of data and how it can really help us uh, fine tune public policies to have a, a much more significant impact. So, for instance, Georgia State um, uses analytics to try to target students who might be more likely to drop out of school and then intervene early uh, before they run into problems. And they've been enormously successful with this. They've been really very successful driving up their graduation rates. So I see, but I see both sides of it. On the other hand, I'm a pretty passionate advocate for privacy. (laughs) And, um, you know, it's just a personal thing. I don't want everybody knowing every click I made Mm -hmm. and every location I have Mm -hmm. been. Um, And I would imagine most of us don't. And uh, you have these, uh, you know, very large companies now. You have maybe the government as well just collecting tremendous amounts of data on us. Um, So I am interested in looking at ways where we do put some brackets around this, um, where, uh, you, you see Europe and California mm-hmm. now have passed legislation, yeah, uh, legislation laws. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To, uh, if, if you do collect data, it really does have to be anonymous. Um, it, it, there have to be a lot of protections around it. As an individual, you need to know so what data is being collected and you're allowed to inquire and, right. and find out about it. And that's sure. very important. And as a citizen, you're also allowed to say, I want you to get rid of all the data that would identify me. Um, and so I think, you know, legislation around that is, is coming and, you know, we do need to find, you know, think about how we're leveraging its power, but at the mm-hmm. same time protecting privacy. So you're not able to identify individuals um, and really drill down in a way that can be very damaging to someone should information, you know, get out. I mean, we look at China and we look the way they locked down Wuhan mm-hmm. and profits in a country like that can do that because there's no privacy. Is the privacy issue. They can lock it down and just stop. And they're supposed, if we can believe their their rates of infection, it's way less now than it used to be. Yeah. Than it was four weeks ago. Yeah. I'm curious if I if I could ask a little bit about education. You yeah. Know, you, you you work a lot with um, students and and folks that are going for. Um, I see now the emphasis on education, kind of getting de-emphasized in a lot of circles. There was a time where we led with edu- you know, educating everyone, free education. It was um, maybe a national security issue as well as a way for economic advancement. And now um, there's a lot of people, they're, they're paying for colleges, getting expensive. And you've got some candidates that are, you know, everyone should be able to go to college for free. And, and most jobs are not requiring that. How do we balance or rebalance our focus around educating our young? Uh, so this is a, a district where we care a lot about education. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the seventh district is about families and children and raising our children and giving them access to the American dream and the opportunity. And I would venture to say that most all of us agree that one of the keys to that is having a really good education. Um, and, you know, I, I do think we have taken our eye off the ball there and, uh, Uh, When I left uh, Georgia State, one of the things I was working on was looking at um, currently about 40 percent of young people uh, in Georgia get some sort of higher education, uh, whether it's through our technical schools or through uh, colleges and universities, to compete with countries uh, like Korea and Canada and Japan, we need 60 percent to get through. That's a Mm. big shift. Um, I think I calculated back of the envelope, it would mean investing around a billion more in our public universities in Georgia to get to that. So we spend, I think, around two billion in state funds on our universities. So that's an enormous (laughs) jump in investment that we would need. Um, We we need to start thinking about that. Um, I generally am not a free person, but I am an affordable person. (laughs) And uh, uh, when I graduated from college, I had a tremendous amount of student debt. It is a, you know, big part of my story. And so I'm deeply sympathetic to young people who have that ball and chain around their ankle. Um, And so it needs to be within reach of every student who wants to go uh, to get a higher education. They should not see cost as a barrier. That's one of the things now, um, I feel there's a generation from 2005 Mm -hmm. to probably 2015 that 
went to college during the economic crisis. When they came out, they were probably underemployed Mm -hmm. because of the economy. And I feel there were at least five years behind where previous generations or peers were. And I don't know if they ever caught up. Um, or at least they haven't caught up yet. They might have. Majority ones? Um, <laughs> economically, where, where, oh, where yeah. they're getting married at 27 to 33 and buying the first house, they're delaying starting a family by five, six years because they're still paying off student right. debt mm-hmm. and those types of things. What can we do, um, you know, for that group that's now getting older? And what do we do to prevent that if that were to happen again so so many folks don't get left behind? Yeah. So we have, you know, one, we just we have not made the baseline investments uh, in programs that are used to reduce the cost of higher education. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went to school on Pell Grants, and I don't think we've increased the Pell Grants in almost a decade instead of what that covers. We have disinvested in our public universities. Um, In 2007 or so, uh, around 75% of the revenues for our public universities, 75% came from tax dollars came from our investment, 25% came from tuition. Uh, Now it is below 50% comes from sort of the state, uh, you know, guarantee or the state input. And, uh, you know, over 50% comes from tuition. And we've seen that in dramatic jumps in the tuition. Uh, Mm -hmm. So one of the big things we need to do also is just reinvest in those public universities so that they are affordable. You don't go to them and you have, you know, some people have hundreds of thousands, but a lot of, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in debt when you leave. Um, So those are certainly some things we can do to try to address that. Um, I'm interested in some of the loan forgiveness as well. I think, you know, there are a lot of folks out there who have a lot of earning potential, right? And they, it's not going to be a big issue, but you know, for lower income folks, people who choose service jobs, people who choose jobs that are, um, you know, in the community that might not make as much, you know, pegging their student loan repayments to a a smaller percentage of their income is certainly something we can do. Forgiveness, you know, for people who go into... So that would be changing really what's going on now, right? Because the education department now had a program of forgiveness for a certain set of people that applied and Mm. supposedly that's not happening. They've undone it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yes, absolutely. I mean, I am running, I deeply disagree with the priorities, right. That we are setting right now. Even even folks that go into a field like teaching um, are leaving because Mm -hmm. the salaries they're making, they can't live. And anyone here could tell you, remember a teacher that probably changed the course of your life because of the way they were able to impact, impact you. Well, yeah. they even spend their own money. I mean, most of them do to buy yeah. stuff for the classroom and things. I, I tell you, the most important person in my life right now is not some Wall Street banker. It's not, yeah. it is my son's second grade teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to treat her and pay her and support her accordingly. Do you think, um, Sandy's been talking a little bit more, I think, about uh, free Again, free, but everything to be free, I guess. But uh, free childcare, mm-hmm. and talking about providing that childcare, um, and also making uh, pre kindergarten, you know, putting an investment in the lower grades mm-hmm. to hopefully bring because it is a big difference, I think, if for a kid that's young that doesn't get taught well, it doesn't have the right exposure. I mean, what do you think yeah, about that? So, yeah, I, I do support mo- moving towards universal pre-K and okay. making that available, not not mandatory, right, but that mm-hmm. any anybody who wants to does have access, just like we have kindergarten, move that down a grade, and that's important. Um, but we need affordable child care, too. Uh, there are lots of women uh, – You know, we want people to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you want people to work, then you need to support them as they do work. And, you know, having quality child care is also extremely important. You're running as a Democrat, and I'm curious, um, are there things that you see the Republican Party doing well? in 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 policy something where they think you think they're on the right path and 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 they might be leading the way in any particular area of policy currently um i think there's a lot of good bipartisan work uh around the va and around Mm -hmm. veterans issues um that's something where 
we have a situation that is is quite bad in the VA. I talked to lots of veterans who have had to wait years. I had a friend whose brother killed himself uh, as he came back and didn't get the mental health treatment that he needed. And I see people in both parties, you know, working together to address those issues. And those are, are very important ones. And I'm glad to see them, you know, move forward on a bipartisan basis. I wonder, like, um, issues like immigration, there, there's a lot of um, uh, polarizing opinions about it. Um, but you do hear some talk of, of finding ways to, to bring more people um, to be naturalized citizens or to become citizens within the country. I hear it on both sides. Uh, Republicans talk mm-hmm. about it. They seem to get stuck in how and when and the pace to do it. Um, but our approach to immigration has drastically shifted in 30 years where I grew up in New York and there was a Statue of Liberty and, and, and I remember it on school trips. It was uh, premier poor and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and arms opening and, and, and the there's been a shift, and I don't know if it's a shift in the people, is it, or is it a shift in the policy? Oh well, I mean, I think Trump clearly ran on a huge anti-immigrant platform, and um, the seventh congressional district, twenty-five percent of the people in this district were born outside of this country, and it is the policies coming out of Washington now around immigration just strike at the heart of this district. Um, And it is interesting, you know, the business community needs immigrants. (laughs) And uh, we have always benefited from bringing the best and the brightest from all over the world, hard workers uh, from all over the world uh, coming to our country and uh, making a life for themselves and their families. And, uh, you know, we have rolled that back. And I was interested to see Mick Mulvaney. Mm. Out there the other day, you know, I guess he slipped up and, <laughs> and said that, uh, you know, wait a minute, these really do have a big economic impact. Mm. If you all will recall, back in 2007, Georgia passed a huge anti-immigrant piece of legislation, and it's kind of evaporated. And what they found was right away uh, after they passed it, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of crops rotted in the fields mm. in South Georgia, and uh, you know. So it's this weird dichotomy. They're like, we don't want immigrants. But then, you know, once that kind of furor passes, oh, wait, we really do need them. I don't know how they would like not realize that, right? I don't know. But it, you know, and then the legislation kind of, you know, was found, you know, to be unconstitutional or illegal in various ways and kind of vanished. Um, You know, we are going to see that same thing cycle again. And one of the problems we have is that our immigration laws do not match the economic realities on the ground. And we need to have that match. I mean, the other thing about immigration is that, you know, we are now, you know, we're a country that deeply believes in human rights and respect for human dignity. And to see what's happening at the border uh, with these camps and, you know, taking children away from their parents, you know, everybody's a parent just feels that in their guts. Uh, you know, how wrong that is. And we have just lost our moral bearings now around immigration. And that fundamentally has to be reestablished. Um, I was just in a Hispanic church a few weekends ago and sat down with a man whose um, uh, brother was here. Uh, he was uh, ran a landscaping business, you know, in our community right mm-hmm. here. And his uh, wife, uh, for some reason, ended up being undocumented, was deported by ICE back to Honduras. And uh, he followed her back and was shortly thereafter killed. His hands were chopped off, his head was chopped off, and his wife was raped. And we're sending people back to their countries and they're being killed. And um, that's really, really wrong. (laughs) And we have to address that, both the moral, the human rights issues, as well as the economic ones in our immigration policy. There's a lot that's going on here in Metro Atlanta. When immigrant, if you go to areas like Clarkston and mm-hmm. others, where you're seeing, um, I'd call a, a rebirth um, of the immigrant communities building businesses there. There's a program there called Start Me um, with Emory, where they're partnering with the universities and and uh, friends of refugees and and nonprofit organizations in the community to help um, new Americans and refugees build businesses here in, in, in the community. And, and it's amazing when you see folks um, that have the ability and all they might need is some help and guidance on navigating. There might be some language skills that they need some help with. 
but they're putting out good business, catering businesses and Mm -hmm. restaurants and clothing businesses and so on because they want to provide and want to create jobs within the community and make sure the money stays within the community. So, you know, if folks want to get a sense of how immigrants are thriving, you know, there's areas right here in in, in Metro Atlanta that they can go and experience that if they they want to kind of just meet someone, have lunch, have coffee, yeah. and it yeah. changes your perception of, yeah. of. And it's not a zero sum game, right? They are creating business and opportunity, and that in turn is lifting everybody up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another important point, you know, about uh, uh, immigrants coming into our community. You know, they bring a tremendous amount of economic growth and vibrancy to our community. We have a few minutes left. Yep. And then we're going to let uh, Carolyn go. Um, but I, I want to get, if you don't mind, just a couple of questions in about politics. Right? Okay. Uh, and that's just about issues. But so we have Sanders and we have Biden. Do you have a choice? No, I'm. <laughs> stay out of that one. I'm staying out of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as you know, down there, they've been talking about Sanders and down the ticket, how that may affect other candidates. You have six, six, I think, running as in the, in the Democratic primary, right? Mm-hmm. And there's seven candidates in the Republicans, so they're having a free for all, free for all on the other side. Mm-hmm. But you've raised the most money mm-hmm. in, in this primary. Do you feel good about winning? I, I do. Yeah, I come in with, you know, I came within 433 votes yes. last time of flipping right. the seat. It was the closest race in the country, yeah. and. Um, you know, I'm starting at, you know, with tremendous momentum coming out of that. I think a lot of folks saw what we accomplished in 2018 and saw it as a victory. I mean, we closed a 20 percentage point gap in this area uh, to get to that point. Uh, the previous Democrat came in at 40 percent. Uh, and so, you know, that enthusiasm, momentum and excitement, you know, it is reflected in my fundraising numbers, right? Those are I saw that. Not, you know, not, quite a bit of money. And, yeah. uh, and, but also in the endorsements, I just picked up Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries right. endorsement. Um, he is a rising star in the House leadership, uh, Democratic House leadership. Uh, I have John Lewis, Andrew Young, Hank Johnson, right. Sam Nunn, you know, a host of local folks. And it's just, you know. We, we are coming back to finish <laughs> what we started last time. How do you feel about Kelly Loeffler? Oh, bless her heart. <laughs> 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 Welcome to politics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we'll leave it there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, uh, All right. Carol. I appreciate you uh, coming down with us. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Um, just uh, getting to talk to folks and getting to hear more about what you think about policies um, and issues that are affecting people every day. Um, you know, thank you very much for, for coming and joining us today. All right. Well, it's a real pleasure to, to talk with you guys. Thank Same. you. Well, um, well, we want to thank everybody for listening to the Capitalist Sage podcast uh, today. Um, I'm Carl Barham with Transworld Business Advisors. Yeah, we help business folks um, figure out exit strategies for businesses. Um, Rico, what do you have coming up? Sure. So Peachtree Corners Magazine, if you go to livinginpeachtreecorners.com, you can find out all about what, what's going on in the city. But the next issue is about youth sports. I love it. About doing good with homegrown nonprofits. And a few other stories. So we're chock full of stuff. So that'll be coming out in that'll be the April May issue. So April tenth, right after spring break ends, is when that's. And, and I'm going to suspect in the next few weeks and months, there's going to be lots of activity here in Atlanta Tech Park. Yes. Um, our sponsor and where we broadcast this podcast from, um, part of the city of Petrie Corners, um, Georgia. Um, we want to bring be a place where business people can come together, um, interact with people in politics in the community um, to help make what 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 the city is really all about. So I uh, want to thank Atlanta Tech Park and invite anybody to come out here and take a look uh, whenever they they have a chance. Mm-hmm. And for that, that's the end of this week's podcast at the Capitalist Sage. Thank you, everybody, for um, listening. Take care. Thank you. This has been The Capitalist Sage with Carl Barham and Rico Figliolini, the twice a month podcast with entrepreneurs and business experts. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Want more? Visit our website at capitalistsagepodcast.com.